to that Kyrie. It's been a yo-yo all season long, and you know it. You and I both know it. The Celtics were a predictable thing. We all knew what they could do because they did it. They made it to the Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals against LeBron James. They did it on the backs of defense and sharing the ball and ball movement. And any given player stepping up at any given time, from Jalen Brown to Jason Tatum to Al Horford, that's who they were a year ago. And then, and then, you insert Kyrie Irving, a guy who's more ball dominant, a guy who doesn't necessarily fit that style of play. And all season long, because of that, it's been a yo-yo. Does Kyrie take over? Yes. Do they win? Sometimes. Are they clicking on all cylinders? Sometimes. Are they looking like they have sand and the engine and salt in the gas tank? Sometimes. I think Kyrie will perform. When I say he's an X factor, I'm not talking about is he going to be bad or is he going to be good. What I mean is this. How will his team fit into his performance? This is a team that wasn't meant, wasn't designed to be run this way. So when Kyrie is taking over, how does Jason Tatum respond? When Kyrie is taking over, how does Jalen Brown respond? When Kyrie is doing playoff Kyrie, what's the chemistry look like in Boston? Because just because he turns into playoff Kyrie doesn't mean the Celtics sing. They have to respond to his style of play. He has to mesh with their style of play. It's got to be like a symphony, man, an orchestra. They're going to have to all play together. He can't break out into a jazz solo in the middle of the Met Opera. It isn't going to work. But if he can take that instrument, if he can take that virtuoso style of play and make it fit into the Celtics, that's an X factor. That's a team that could take down the Bucks. Could. Could. I don't think they will. But I acknowledge the X factor that Kyrie and the Celtics with Gordon Hayward, Jalen Brown, and Marcus Smart coming back represent. That's a team that can go through a wild swing. The Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil performance line. And you can always get in touch with the show through the 1-800-Flowers Twitter feed. So I can talk to some of y'all about what we saw going on with Tiger. Woo! That's what I keep thinking about. I'll be remembering that movie Shaft with Samuel L. Jackson. When they called him Tiger, we saw the, the, the guy called him Tiger. Woo! Tiger. Woo! No question. 888 ESPN. It's 888 Stephen A. Smith Show live right here with you on ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Get triple action protection for optimal engine performance with Shell V-Power Nitro plus premium gasoline. I'm going to call up as always. Did they say ESPN? John, the calls went off the screen. They're back on right now. I'm sorry. It was uh, messing up the screen. It was messing up, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize, but let's get right to it. Let's go to Brian. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, big How are you, man? Yeah, first-time caller, long-time listener. Thank you. What's up? Um, with um, your other show. Um, I want to also say I was rooting for Tiger. I didn't think he was going to win. I was hoping he would to put everybody to silence, but um, when he did, I figured it might be by one or two shots, which it ended up being, but I think he can win another two this year. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on it. I, I think that he can win the U.S. Open. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to count him out. I think he's going to ride the momentum in the Pebble Beach, California, June 13th to June 16th. I think he can pull it off. Until we see otherwise, why not? Because again, it's not about his exceptionalism. It's about the fact that he made others unexceptional because they heard his footsteps and it mattered to them. Malinari, I think that matters. Kepka, I think that matters. Tony for now, I think that matters. I think that you had guys that were in the mix, but somehow, some way, he affected them. And I think that when you have that situation occurring with Tiger Woods, that reminds you of the Tiger Woods of old. Because again, you can't play defense in golf. All you could do is sit up there and watch them. When he sits up there and he marks his when he marks the, the his spot with the ball, and then he stares at his two competitors uh, are next to him. He's sitting there looking right at him. All of a sudden, you just see them and they don't seem the same. These are the kind of things I notice. Now it could just be me, but it matters. You know, two hundred seventy isn't the greatest round in the world, 
but it was enough. Why? Because Tiger was coming, and it affected those who were ahead of him, like Molinari. Really, just Molinari. So that's really what it comes down to, and I think that's what you got to pay attention to. All right? Appreciate the call. Thank you so much. Let's go to Matt. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, Matt. What's up? Hey, Stephen A., long-time listener, man, first-time caller. Thank you. So happy about Tiger Woods winning. And I think what's really fascinating is uh, the betting line. I really believe this man is going to surpass Jack Nicholas. I think it's a foregone conclusion. Just like you said, he just had to hit – he had to make the first one. And he won. Um, to give you some context specifically, I tried – I've never done a sports bet before, Stephen A. I'm not a gambler. I can't even afford – to throw money away. Last year, I wanted to bet $10,000 on Tiger Woods doing this. And believe it or not, Bovada gave us 120 to 1 odds back in February. Once he won at Valspar, uh, Valspar I don't know how to pronounce it, in March, mm -hmm. it, the odds went from 120 to 33 to 1 mm -hmm. before last year's Masters. The problem is they wouldn't even, like, get, uh, allow you to win more than $1,000, so I couldn't really do the bet. Mm -hmm. I was so frustrated at it. Vegas wouldn't take the bet, so I bet $1. I got $1 on Tiger Woods, surpassing Jack Nicholas. I just want to get some context for the people thinking about the bets. Well, I need, you you know, to I, need you, I need you to hurry up, though. You need to hurry up. You're taking too damn long with this story. Go ahead. Oh, well, that's it, man. I'm just oh, so okay. happy for Tiger Woods, and I just think he's going to beat Jack Nicholas. Well, I think, listen, I hope so. And I think I think he will surpass Jack Nicholas. I don't think there's anybody that's going to stop him. Listen, this is not basketball or football or whatever where you got to play a full season, then go through the postseason, and then after that you get to the championship round so you only get one shot. No. Got four majors a year. He's going to play at least three more years. You're talking about 12 shots at the apple. Why would I think that he can't pull off, the, you know, winning a third of those? Why not? Who's the definitive person that's going to stand in the way? We thought it was going to be Jordan Smith at one time. That isn't the case recently. We thought it was going to be Roy, Roy McIlroy at one time. That isn't the case. Justin Johnson is no joke. He was there, but didn't win it. I mean, we don't know. We don't know. That's just me. Gerald, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. What's up? Hey, Stephen A. Uh, long time fan. First time caller. Thank you, man. Go ahead. I was actually calling. Um, I agree with what you said earlier with Tiger Woods as far as as long as his back holds up, I think he can. He got mm -hmm. the person out of the way. Mm -hmm. And as far as his personal digression, digressions, it was nobody's personal business, transgressions. But go ahead, family transgressions. Go go ahead. Transgressions. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and then the other question I had was with the Lakers. I think uh, the best coach would be Mighty Williams because of the respect. Uh, respect to the, uh, held listen, listen. Community. Let me say this. I love Monty Williams, and he is profoundly liked and respected in the NBA community. I'm not saying he can't coach. Please don't get me wrong. He was, a, he was a decent head coach in New Orleans. Some people thought he got screwed over. He shouldn't have been fired. But nobody ever accused him of being exceptional at coaching. Do I think he has the potential to be? Yes. But I don't know. What you do know is that he's an exceptional individual who is impossible to root against. And as a result, there's an abundance of people who want him to get that job. That doesn't mean he is the ideal candidate qualified to get the job. Mark Jackson, he was successful at Golden State. How come he's not getting a look at? I don't understand. Tyron Lue is a champion that guided LeBron's team to three straight championships. Excuse me, we can't ignore that. We got to give credit where credit is due. If Phil Jackson can get credit for having 11 championships when you were coaching Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, and then after that, Shaq, and Kobe, then how come Tyron Lue can't get credit for coaching LeBron? How come that can't happen? I agree with that point. So that, that, that's my point. So I look at it from that perspective. And as, as, as it pertains to Luke Walton, I'm glad you brought that up. I want to say this to everybody out there listening about Luke Walton. I am happy Luke Walton got the job. Luke Walton deserves this opportunity. I thought he got screwed over with the roster that he had made available to him this year with the Lakers. And I thought that he got dealt an unfair hand. I completely and totally applaud Steve Kerr speaking up for his friend and his former subordinate in Luke Walton. All of that's true. And I don't have a problem with, with K 
King's ownership and Vlade Divac hiring Luke Walton either. But I want to state this. It's a damn travesty that the man had the job before he even walked out of the Lakers facility. Do I need to sit up here and, and, and call for the Rooney rule to be invoked in the sport of basketball? I mean, damn. This guy had a job before he had a chance to pass gas. And we all know that the Lakers spent the year sticking up the joint. He's won 40% of his games. Now, again, I am a proponent of Luke Walton being the head coach of the Kings. He's a, you talk about Monty Williams being a good guy. You need to go and learn Luke Walton. What a great guy he is. And I'm partial to him because I love his daddy, Bill Walton. One of the more phenomenal individuals that I've ever known. I love that man. So I am very happy for Luke Walton, who has always been good to me. I have no problem with him getting the job. I have a problem with the absence of the process. I mean, damn. Luke Walton walked away from the Lakers, mutually agreed to walk away from the Lakers job on Friday. Wojnarowski was reporting that Luke Walton and them were in negotiations that afternoon. I mean, come on. Because it's important that those interview, those candidates are interviewed so we can know that the process is being honored and other people get an opportunity to be highlighted so we'll know about them. I have no problem with Luke Walton getting the job. I have a problem with how quickly he got it. And oh, by the way, for you Laker fans out there, if you are still thinking that Magic Johnson walked away because of Luke Walton, you're just a new fool. I told y'all last week before I went on vacation. Had nothing to do with Luke Walton. Luke Walton was gone. Palenka was going to make sure of that. Jeannie Buss was going to sign off on that. Magic Johnson, it was done. That ain't why Magic Johnson walked away. Rob Palenka appears to have had something to do with that because Magic Johnson was not complimentary of him walking out the door. He talked about chirping and backstabbing, and I told you, fair or unfair, truth or not true, there was a lot of scuttlebutt about stuff that was being chirped about Magic behind his back. And now we're talking about Palenka, who, by the way, is incredibly accomplished as an agent, very, very capable, Damn great basketball mind. Anybody that, that Kobe support with it, in terms of having a basketball mind, I, side, I stand with Kobe. So this is not questioning Rob Palenka's ability in terms of a basketball mind. What I will tell you is we ain't seen it yet since he's been with the Lakers, A, and B, whether it's agents or team executives, very few people like him and are interested in doing business with him according to everything that I've heard. So if that man is going to be running the Lakers, it makes sense why Bill Plasky wrote a phenomenal column this past Friday going off about the state of affairs with the Los Angeles Lakers. I mean, it's, not, it's just bad right now. And it's looked like it, it looks like it's about to get worse. Stay tuned. 888-SAY-ESPN, it's 888-729-3776. Back to your phone calls and more in a minute. On Tiger, before we get into the NBA playoffs in hour number two, don't touch that dial. It's Stephen A. in the house coming your way right here live on ESPN Radio and ESPN News. By the way, one other thing to say, if you missed my opening segment, go check it out on demand in the Stephen A. Smith podcast, brought to you by the Capital One Saver Card. Earn 4% cash back on dining and entertainment, 2% of grocery stores, and 1% on all other purchases. Hey, what's in your wallet? More to Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio and ESPN News in a minute. 